Dr. Rhett Martin is a senior lecturer at the University of Southern Queensland, and his research focus is on sustainability and its intersection with the law. He has published several articles on sustainability law and regulations over the past seven years. Dr. Martin enjoys educating students about incorporating principles of ecologically sustainable development into natural resource management and conservation legislation. Passionate about the intersection between law and sustainability, Dr. Martin discusses the legal aspects of sustainability and shows how laws and sustainability affect each other. I'll start by just acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land that we are operating on and uh, pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. Thank you for the opportunity for me to speak tonight. I'm looking at a, a fundamental question, um, the legal status of sustainability in Australia. And um, it may be a relatively straightforward question, but it uh, doesn't admit of a very uh, simple answer. And what I will start with is just to acknowledge that in Australia, we have uh, adopted into approximately 60 pieces of legislation, mainly dealing with uh, natural resource management and conservation, principles of ecological sustainable development. Now, these principles have been incorporated into state and federal legislation, uh, and they've been around since 1992 onwards. And they have been adopted into different forms of regulation and uh, they basically represent the way that Australia has adopted sustainability in, in, uh, in terms of natural resource management and conservation. So these principles require an inherent balance between economic growth and ecological protection. And so the principles themselves are probably well known to a lot of people uh, listening in, but they come down basically to five different categories. The first is that um, decision making processes should effectively uh, integrate both long term and short term thinking and take into consideration economic, environmental, social and equitable considerations. The second principle uh, refers often referred to as the precautionary principle states that where there are threats of serious or irreversible environmental damage a lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to prevent environmental degradation and this principle is uh, basically implicitly acknowledging that science and science methodologies have their uh, limitations and because of those limitations it is unlikely that the full consequences of a particular act upon the environment can be known in advance hence the need for uh, precautionary measures even in the absence of full scientific knowledge so that's the second one the precautionary principle the third one is the principle of intergenerational equity which is essentially positing the idea that current generations should be trustees for future generations in, in terms of looking after the environment. And the fourth principle is that conservation of um, biological diversity and ecological integrity should be a fundamental consideration in decision making. And the final one is that there should be uh, improved valuation and pricing mechanisms, so essentially to take into account environmental factors when producing uh, goods and services so that the full life cycle cost of producing those goods and services and the full environmental cost is taken into account. Now those five categories of, uh, of principles of ESD have been adopted into Australian uh, natural resource management uh, legislation and also into conservation legislation and so I put the question well how successful has that integration been uh, since it started in the early 90s and I'm answering that question by essentially looking at two categories of legislation one is in relation to natural resource management and the other is in relation to conservation and I, put, I make the point that the integration has not really been that successful 
Um, and one of the reasons for that is that principles of ESD, ecologically sustainable development, represent a diversity of practical and procedural challenges, which are hard to uh, translate into regulation. And therefore it creates a problem in terms of how we go about defining sustainability um, and coming to answer our question that we put at the beginning as to what do we mean by sustainability and how we adopted it into Australian law. So we asked the question, does, does sustainability in this context of ESD represent a substantive outcome or a procedural process or a combination of these or something else? Does it represent a legal norm, like a, a principle of law that is binding and therefore should be followed? And the answer is fairly complex, but the way that I'm trying to answer it today is to look at uh, an example of natural resource management with the, the Sustainable Forest Timber Act 2004 in Victoria, which adopts the principles of ESD in section five of the act, but it does so in a way that is fairly um, ineffective because the, the way that they've been incorporated in section five is that they do not have mandatory application. There is only a requirement that the principles be considered basically to have regard to these principles when making decisions. So there is a, an invocation to have regard to the principles, but there isn't a mandatory requirement to apply the principles in the decision-making process. To consider, to consider them, yes, but to apply them, they're not mandatory in that sense. So is this a, a, an effective application of the ESD principles? The answer is quite emphatically no. And I look at reasons why by uh, basically highlighting that simply incorporating these principles into uh, legislation like this with a non-mandatory requirement to consider them, but not necessarily to apply them, um, or do not represent a legally enforceable standard. And they can't be classified as representing a legal norm, which means like a, a principle that should be followed regardless. So they represent perhaps what could be described as a procedural uh, guideline, if you like, in the decision-making process. The other, the other limitation that's within this Act, the Sustainable uh, Forest Timber Act in Victoria, is that the Act does refer to what's referred to as criteria and indicators of sustainability, which provide a list of things that need to be considered in assessing sustainable management of a forest such as you know, the extent of forest cover, coverage and, and biodiversity and species uh, being retained in forest regions, et cetera. And these, all, these, along with a number of other criteria and indicators, including governance criteria, are used only for to report on how well the sustainable management of the forest is, is, is being undertaken. And it's actually not used in a day-to-day -day operational sense. In other words, the criteria and indicators are used in a reporting context after the event in terms of forests being cut down, but not in operational management on a day-to-day -day basis, which I consider to be a fundamental flaw by, by their, their not being used in an operational day-to-day -day basis. So because of that fact, it's not possible to measure a particular sustainability outcome as it's happening in an operational sense with operational forestry being undertaken. It's, that it's measured post the event on five yearly reporting requirements mandated under the Act. And so the way that the, what the Act is structured is that there is no separate status of sustainability as a measurable standard. Uh, it's really just uh, a case of including principles of ecologically sustainable development as a guideline in decision making, as a, as a thing to can take into account along with a whole raft of other things when making decisions about the management of forests in Victoria, but pro providing no mandate on how the process is being done operationally 
on a day-to-day -day basis. So really, I'm suggesting that the way that it's currently being used in Victoria is at best a procedural guideline, but even that is perhaps debatable. So therefore, we can trust we can contrast the operation of the principles of ESD in terms of natural resource management with an example of uh, legislation which is designed to be conservation based. And I'm using the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act 1975, which is a Commonwealth Act. And in that Act, um, sustainability is not defined, but it's implicit within the main object of the Act when it states that um, the aim of the Act, the object of the Act, is the long-term protection and conservation of the environment. So the objects also make reference to uh, the requirement to uh, include ecological sustainable use of the reef and refers to regulation of the reef consistent with principles of ecologically sustainable use. Of course, it's not development because it's about conservation. So ecologically sustainable use. And the uh, reef, the Great Barrier Reef Authority must act uh, under the requirements of the Act in uh, a way that is consistent with the objects of ESD principles. So um, the, the suggestion here under the way, the way that sustainability is included in this Act is that uh, it prioritizes environmental protection and conservation uh, over the use of the reef um, and uh, the definition of eco ecologically sustainable use refers to the use of natural resources consistent with the protection and conservation uh, of the reef and based on an ecosystem-based management structure and, and something that's within the capacity of the natural resource to sustain natural processes and ensure interge intergenerational equity. So the Act goes a little bit further than the Sustainable Forest Timber Act by um, uh, also defining a sustainable sustainability related role for the regulator in stipulating that the uh, Great Barrier Reef Park Authority must have regard to and seek to act in a way which is consistent with the objects of the Act and principles of ecologically sustainable use. So this places uh, sustainability more in the context of a legislative duty but does not go to the to the extent of it being a legal norm, which would mean like a binding principle that gets uh, that has to be applied no matter what. So um, it's a different focus here. On the one hand, we've got the uh, other example that I'm using with the Sustainable Forest Timber Act, dealing with the management of a natural resource and having the inclusion of principles of ecological sustainable development being uh, used as uh, procedural guidelines at best, but even that might be pushing it uh, because of the non-mandatory application of the principles. And then we contrast it with the example given here in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act, where it talks about um, various uses or obligations that the, the Marine Park Authority has to act consistently with the objects of ESD principles and so that places sustainability more in the context of a legislative duty, but not, but, but not, have, not taking it so far that it is a legal norm that must be followed in all circumstances. So that brings us to some, some tentative conclusions in answer to the question about whether uh, the status of what, what is the status of sustainability in Australia in a legal context. Uh, first of all, I would make the point that sustainability must be looked at on a sector by sector basis and make a distinction between conservation based legislation and natural resource uh, legislation. And um, the fact that legislation uh, fails to mandate the use of sustainability criteria and indicators, you know, such as, you know, sustainable yield, making sure, for example, that with uh, the amount of forestry undertaken, that it's only done on the basis of the, it being sustainable and that they're only taking out as much as what can be sustainably 
uh, maintained over time. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that that's not present in natural resource um, legislation means that there is a big gap in legislation because of the failure to use criteria of sustainability on a day-to-day -day operational basis. Uh, so what we've got, even with the contrast between the two categories of conservation-based legislation and natural resource management legislation is legislation, uh, sustainability and legislation does not yet represent a legal norm and the inclusion of principles of ESD, therefore, in my view, uh, in legislation is flawed and is in need of overhaul for two main reasons. Firstly, in addition to what I've said tonight, the fact that you include ESD principles into legislation and, they, and, and even if they're mandatory in terms of their consideration in the decision-making process, there is no detail in legislation as to the trigger for their use and application. There's no uh, clarity over when they should be uh, used and at what point. And there are no application methodologies for their effective application once a decision has been made to use them. So the absence of effective trigger points as to when they should be used, the absence of application methodologies as to how they are applied in different contexts, the absence of that in legislation mm -hmm. means that uh, in answer to the question of you know, what is the status of sustainability in Australia, well, it has no real status, except to say that it may be seen in some natural resource legislation as a procedural guideline uh, and in some conservation legislation as a statutory duty, but it's a long way behind being a legal norm which needs to be followed on a, uh, a regular basis in an ongoing context. It needs to be looked at in a sectorial way, it needs to be examined on a um, you know, sector by sector basis. A and we should be looking at it in the context of, you know, how is it being applied? How, what is the trigger for its application? Are there any application methodologies? And currently in Australia, uh, that is not the case. So the status of sustainability in law in Australia is really embryonic at the moment and there's still a lot more work to be done thank you